So today we want to look at some of the big changes, some of the, the challenges that faced the country during its, its early national period, the, the period of the Federal Union. You know, by 1789, 1790, the leaders of America had a pretty optimistic view, particularly men like Washington, right, because they uh, had gotten together with other nationalistic wealthy, uh, leading men. They had scrapped the Articles of the Confederation. They had created, drafted a, a new constitution, uh, gotten it ratified by the states, and created th this new, far more efficient, centralized, nationally focused government, right? The Constitutional United States, the Federal Union. And men like Washington and Hamilton and Roger Sherman and, and Randolph, you know, we're in their glory. They really had this point in time where we're now moving forward as a modern nation, a democratic nation, a constitutional nation. And yet, 1796, Washington is stepping down from his second term as president. He's been president for eight years, and he delivers his farewell address. And in his farewell address, Washington is surprisingly not very optimistic. He's hopeful. He has a deep love for this country that he helped to found, that he fought to create, and yet he has some really deep concerns. Concerns that he wants to caution the public as he walks away. You know, Washington, I think, had the same worries that many great men of revolutions have. You know, much of what had held the country together and the revolution together, the main unifying figure was Washington himself, right? The mythical hero of the revolution. So even when there's divisions in the country, they still had Washington to lend authenticity and authority and legitimacy. And like many revolutions, there's a worry. Will this revolution hold together? Will the, the different parties and groups that are contentious remain working together when the great man is gone? And this is not atypical, right? This is true, you know, Russian Revolution after Lenin, or even in modern times, I, I think of Nelson Mandela, whose personhood did a lot to really bring together a lot of competitive parties and groups in a troubled nation. And there's the worry, does it survive after he steps down from the presidency and after his death? These are real concerns, right? That's really when the revolution and the new nations are tested. And Washington has this on his mind. He'll die two years later in 1798. So we look at his farewell address, and I want to say there's, there's three key areas that he highlights as potential problems of causing chaos and division and instability. And I'm going to name them now, and we're going to look at them, a few of them more closely in this lecture. The first big area that he talks about is diplomacy, foreign policy, and America's involvement with the rest of the world. You know, this would remain, uh, had been since 1783, all the way up into the 1820s. What is America's role in the world? How does this new, fledgling, fragile nation reassert itself, reestablish global trade, which it desperately needed, without becoming involved in the ever-growing, deadly, chaotic wars of continental Europe. You know, the mid-1790s, we've had the French Revolution of the late 1780s has erupted across the continent as these revolutionary armies and then later the armies of Napoleon have declared war on monarchies everywhere. England and France and all the countries of Europe are in a, a deep and deadly and expansive war. And America is trying to reassert itself, re-engage in a global world that's chaotic, that has no place for neutrality. And one of the biggest things he wants to do, and we'll talk more about Washington's foreign policy in another lecture, but just so we're here, is that Washington puts forth this idea of no 
entangling alliances. The idea of neutrality. He says at one time that the goal of American foreign policy in relation to European powers should be to administer to their wants, meaning sell them things, sell them raw materials from America without becoming engaged in their quarrels. No entangling alliances. He realized that early on, America was in no place to get involved in, in disastrous European warfare. We don't even have a standing army. We couldn't pick one side or another. And yet, the struggle to remain neutral politically while remaining commercially engaged with all would be one of the great challenges of the early republic. I should say, by and large, it is one of the warnings that Washington gives that's pretty well heeded. I mean, all the way up until World War I, this idea of avoiding entangling alliances and, and global warfare in Europe while uh, paying attention to commercial interests and our interests in this hemisphere is the foreign policy of the United States. It's not easy to maintain, but they do pursue it, and for obvious reasons. The next area where Washington really has some deep worries has to do with something called partisanship. Partisanship, that America was breaking down into these sort of competitive political parties, that people were engaging in politics not as individuals, not as nationalists, but aligning themselves in very specific political parties. And these political parties were contentious, they were divisive, they were causing social discord, even outright violence. The political parties themselves proved one of the greatest challenges to maintaining neutrality as each party either favored France or England. We'll talk about that more in a little minute. But that's this idea, this partisanship, his warning about breaking up into parties. Washington had a deep fear of uh, partisanship, bipartisanship in the particular. And also growing out of partisanship, a third worry, one that I think proved to be uh, the most worrisome of all of the uh, divisive aspects of the er early republic, and that is sectionalism. Sectionalism. You know, sectionalism is this idea that you are more loyal to the culture of a region or a state than you are to the nation as a whole. Right? You define yourself by the section or the region you live in, and it defines you politically, economically, socially. This, of course, is, was one of the great challenges of the colonial era, of the revolutionary era, and it would remain for all of early America and, and beyond. One of the great challenges to maintaining uh, a united and dynamic federal union. Right now, I want to talk more specifically about partisanship and sectionalism. Partisanship, you know, what we think of as competitive political parties, the political parties that dominate, you know, American political culture to this day, take shape during the early 1790s, this very early federal period. You know, we have this, this moment where we create this, this dynamic national government with the U.S. Constitution, and yet at that very same moment, at its birth, we have the seeds of partisan politics. Basically, by the mid-1790s, and, and certainly by 1800, you know, Americans would not really engage in politics as, you know, virtuous, individualistic, nationally-minded citizens. More often than not, they would engage in politics as members of a political party. The political parties will pick our political leaders. They will sponsor them. They will run them. Right? They will determine who is elected and who is not elected, who is even chosen to be elected. Two parties will determine this, and this is, of course, still the case. The earliest stages of bipartisanship that we can de detect starts during the ratification process of the Constitution. You know, 1788, the Constitution is sent out to all of the states for ratification. And in each and every state, there's a battle over whether or not they will ratify the Constitution. And on the one side, we have a group that becomes known as the Federalists, right? Known as the Federalists. And its leaders are George Washington and Roger Sherman and Alexander Hamilton. And, and in this particular phase, uh, James Madison. These are nationally minded men. They 
uh, you know, favor a strong centralized government that will promote a federal identity over a state identity. They're very organized. They're very, uh, they're classical Republicans, right? That they feel that the, the most virtuous elite among us should rule on behalf of others. And of course, they're very organized from the outset. The opposition to the ratification of the Constitution is not really that organized. It becomes loosely termed by historians as the anti-federalists. These are not organized political parties. It's not like Democrats or Republicans now. But there is a certain consistency among the opposition to the Constitution uh, ideologically. You know, most particularly, I say the ideological leader would be men like Jefferson, who really resisted the idea of, of a super strong centralized government, who was actually willing to trade a certain amount of national political efficiency to maintain the ideals of liberty, particularly state liberty. And there's a lot of resistance to the ratification of this Constitution. Now, in this given play between these Federalists and these Anti-Federalists, a pretty good thing happens. One, the Federalists are more organized. They, they get the jump, so they're able to get the Constitution ratified pretty much in its exact form. However, the opposition of these Anti-Federalists give us one very, very important thing. That's the Bill of Rights. That in order to get New York and Virginia, you know, two of the largest and most dynamic states, to sign off, to ratify this Constitution, they had to make a promise to include an enumerated Bill of Rights that defined rights that all individuals have, individual liberties and rights that no government, even a democratically elected government, can transgress. Right? These rights are sacred. They can't be transgressed. It's the protections of an individual against this new, powerful, centralized, national constitutional government. And it works, you know, by 1790, James Madison has actually made it his, his business to collect all different ideas for this Bill of Rights. And of course, we have the first 10 amendments, which become the Bill of Rights. We see in this, in this struggle, actually a pretty good thing comes out of it. We get a constitution, but this opposition, this ideological, not quite a party, but certainly partisanship opposition gives us something else, right? Gives us something else important, a Bill of Rights. By the mid-1790s, what started out as anti-federalist and federalist, these sort of loose ideological identities, has actually hardened into actual political parties. Political parties that we would recognize today, where they are nominating and sponsoring specific candidates. They have uh, really strict and clear ideological differences. Their leaderships compete with one another. They have newspapers. Every town had newspapers that were either loyal to one party or the other. And they would, you know, attack each other. It becomes a very partisan time. And I want to go over who the political parties were at this time and just what they believed, right? What, what, how we would define each party. So first of all, the first thing we need to say, what are the names of the parties? They actually do take on names. On one side, we have the Federalists. You know, the Federalists, their leaders would be, again, these sort of nationally minded um, political men like Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, John Adams, George Washington, right? They're kind of classical Republicans. That's leadership on the one side. On the other side, you know, the Anti-Federalists had morphed and it becomes something known as the Republicans. Now, I want to say they call themselves Republicans and sometimes history books uh, and historians refer to them as the Democratic Republicans, and they do this for a reason. This Republicans is not the Republicans of today, right? Today's political party, the grand old party, the Republicans, you know, evolves in the 1850s, right, out of, out of the Whigs. These Republicans actually will eventually become the Democratic Party of today, all right? That's, that's their lineage, but at the time they were called the Republicans. It's a little confusing because it's a name used twice. But just so we know, we could sometimes delineate them as the Democratic Republicans. Okay, but they would eventually become the Democrats. They call themselves the Republicans. So we have a difference in leadership. You know, we'll say over here, Hamilton and John Adams. 
Over here, two leaders come out. The intellectual leader, first Secretary of State, eventual president in 1800, is Thomas Jefferson. Interesting thing about Jefferson, Jefferson did not like to mix it up politically. He liked to kind of be behind the scenes, an intellectual leader. And so basically he has a young protege, someone who started out as a Federalist, uh, one of the writers of the Constitution, and that's James Madison, a fellow Virginian, who comes into his sphere. And James Madison is really Jefferson's political bulldog, but he's very important to these Democratic Republicans. Whenever Jefferson really wants, James Madison will be the Speaker of the House, and whenever he really wants legislation put into place uh, or some sort of real kind of like roll up your sleeves political leadership, he turns to Madison. Madison is, he's like I'd say, sort of Jefferson's bulldog. The biggest division, the first thing that really delineated these parties, and this can't be underestimated, it's why, uh, is foreign policy, right? And, 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 and loyalties to different foreign nations. It's one of the reasons why Washington uh, put all three of these together in his farewell address, sectionalism, partisanship, and foreign policy, because they were all connected in the 1790s deeply. You know, the Federalists are very pro-England. Now, that may seem odd, but you've read the textbook, so you should know. Pro-England, didn't, didn't Washington and Adams lead a revolution against England? Well, yes, of course they did. They wanted their independence from England. They liked creating a, a, a non-monarchical society, and they have this, this new democracy. However, they had the national interest at heart. And, you know, prior to the revolution, America's economy is almost uh, an entire export economy, right? We had this very enviable export economy. And the main place our exports went were to England and to England's colonies, right? That's, that was our mercantilist relationship. Reestablishing those commercial ties are all important for the financial and economic and social health of this early nation. These men know that. There's really no other way around it. England is the 900 pound gorilla in, in the Atlantic at this time. And so somehow repairing our relationships with England and reestablishing our commercial ties and our financial ties to England is very, very important. Secondly is you know, Alexander Hamilton had a real actual love for England. He loved the English model. He saw them as very modern. They had this close alignment between government and business. They had uh, far more sophisticated and advanced manufacturing, uh, more developed urban financial spaces and a banking system. He loved the English system. He felt we should model ourselves after England in this respect. Yeah, we don't have a king anymore. We have democratic government. but. England is the dominant power on the globe. Why wouldn't we imitate their system is how they think. And finally, it's a cultural thing. You know, we fought a revolution against England. We broke away. And in so many ways, culturally, we are fundamentally English. We spoke English, right? English culture, English writing, English trends and fashions are popular in America. We are close to them culturally. And it's foolish to ignore that, right? That's where our, our international political sympathies should lie as far as our foreign pol policy should be more focused on England. On the other side is France. Now, pro-France had a couple of reasons. One, men like Jefferson and a lot of the revolutionary, especially the ideologically driven aspect of the revolutionary generation, were grateful to France. 1778, we have our only entangling foreign alliance, it's with France. And that treaty with France enabled our success in the revolution. Like we've talked about this, there's no other way around it. And we felt grateful to France. We felt a uh, real affinity with them as a fellow nation. Also, in the late 1780s, France had launched its own revolution for liberty had executed the king, had overturned their society. And, you know, the really ideological-minded uh, people in America, especially men like Jefferson, saw great hope in France, saw a continuation of the ideological, enlightened revolution started in America, carried out in France. And in fact, France sees this as well. The revolutionary leaders of France will send over emissaries and advocates and people to come here to, you know, stir up... Uh, support for France, to help raise armies for France in some cases. 
there's a lot of the French Revolution being exported to America. They thought we were like-minded. We had also fought a revolution to overthrow the rule of a king and created a democracy, right? Now I should say the French Revolution, and this is part of why these guys are pro-British, was far more chaotic, far more violent, far more extreme than the American Revolution. Far more people would die. The French had, you know, as after killing their own king, launched these revolutionary armies across Europe to attack kings everywhere. I mean, really ideologically driven armies. And by the late 1790s, they would come under control of a dictator, Napoleon, who would, you know, channel that energy, martial energy into a, a more systematic attempt to conquer Europe. And so the French Revolution meant war and instability and chaos. It meant the execution of aristocrats, right? The Federalists are very afraid of that happening in America. As much as these men many of them were part of a revolution. They didn't want that kind of a revolution. The American Revolution was a far more moderate revolution, right? One that strove to maintain the institutions that already exist rather than tearing down every institution and creating something truly radical. So these democratic republicans like France, they lean more towards the French radicalism. They felt our foreign policy should be in lockstep with the French efforts, that we should be forging new cultural ties with them. And the Federalists, for business reasons, for economic reasons, cultural ones, and political ones, right, sort of anti-revolutionary ones, are pro-England. And maintaining these positions would prove to be a great challenge. But they're really, if you were to say the one thing that really gives rise to political parties in the countries, it's this division over foreign policy. Another big difference has to do with business. You know, the Federalists can be loosely be called sort of pro-business. and finance. And it's not that the Democratic Republicans hated business and finance, but the Federalists believed, like England, that this new powerful national government was in a unique position to encourage business, to sort of shepherd the economy in a wise and rational way so that it would, it would grow, it would strengthen the country. You know, men like Hamilton wanted and actually created a national bank that would control our debt would assume the debt of all the states, uh, would be responsible for printing a uniform currency, right? could provide financing for internal improvements, and could also sponsor manufacturing. You know, the, uh, the Federalists wanted to see a rise in manufacturing, a growth in our cities, so that our cities were more like London, larger, more dynamic, more wealth being created, and the ability to actually manufacture goods, not just process raw materials, and agricultural goods. And so they sort of had this national vision of a sort of coordinated effort between uh, government policy and the growth of big business, particularly urbanized manufacturing business and high finance. The Republicans, it's probably not fair to say that they're anti-big business, but they were very wary of this model. What they really were, I'm gonna say they were pro-agrarian. Nism. Agrarianism is farming. You know, Jefferson would come up with this idea, this sort of philosophy of agrarianism, philosophy of agrarianism. And basically that he believed that the sort of businesses we pursued, the sort of economy we have, should promote Republican virtue. All that virtue we talked about in previous lectures. He said, you know, the way we make money, the way we order our society has everything to do, right, with our virtue, our health, our style of politics, our ideology. And he felt big business and finance was corrupt, led to corruption, led to huge differentiations in wealth, would go against the national interest, was anything but virtuous, right? Business and finance don't promote virtue. And frankly, Jefferson may have had a point. And what he liked, his idealized vision was small farmers, right? The small farmer who produced a surplus that he could sell on a market, sell on international markets, because he believed that food would always be in demand. You know, in the 1790s, American agricultural exports are in demand. Europe is torn up by war. They're desperate for food. And that he felt there was something noble about owning land, working it, using, owning a piece of America. Not just the idea of owning property, but actual property that you worked and improved. 
right? And you passed on. You had a stake that farmers were by nature sober, serious, uh, rational, and virtuous, right? That sort of simple Republican virtue that was engaged in farming. And this wasn't just an idealized version. He also thought it was better for economics. It was more stable, more predictable, didn't lead to rapid growths of cities with all of the chaos that cities had, large landless groups of poor who would riot, right? He felt this was better for democracy. If most people were small, productive landowners, they would be better citizens, more stable citizens, more able to participate rationally in a democratic government. That was all tied to this style of business. He didn't want this European style business. He felt agrarianism. And there's a lot of support for this, both ideologically with men like Jefferson and politically and practically as most Americans are farmers. They are small farmers. This is what they do for a living. This does define it, define the American economy truly in, in the colonial period, the revolutionary period, and through most of the early national period and beyond. So it's got this kind of agrarian idea that offsets the idea of big business. We shouldn't think of it as hostile to big business, but it is different. It is a different vision that the sort of eco economy and economic pursuits you have as a nation determines your political culture and your social culture. And he felt this was better for Republican virtue, for a democracy. Obviously, one of the big fundamental difference has to do with um, federalism, right? They're called the Federalists. What does that actually mean? Well, it believes that while we are a, a union of distinct states, ultimately our federated identity, the American national government, this idea we think of ourselves as Americans first, and that power should rest with a centralized government first, right? It's the essence of federalism, right? The idea that you would have a more efficient, right? Uh, more capable, more rational government in this sort of federated model. So, you know, they promoted a strong national government. Right? National government. Conversely, and this should be an obvious dichotomy, right? If the national centralized government is, you know, the heart and soul of the Federalists, well, the Democratic Republicans, they're states' rights, right? People like Jefferson and Madison thought democracy worked better when it was. Uh, when powers were devolved onto uh, smaller and smaller groups, right? A smaller group, one vote has more power. And they liked the idea of state rights, right? They thought states should have a much more independence. Also growing out <clears throat> of this idea of state rights, and this cannot be divorced from the Democratic Republicans. You know, the pro-agrarian in virtue uh, and many things seem very ideologically high-minded. But there's something else from the very beginning that you do have to know that these Democratic Republicans and then later the Democrats were, and that's pro-slavery. They were the party of Southern slavery almost from their founding. Slave rights. You know, they linked slavery to states' rights. They linked it to agrarianism. They linked it to property rights, individual property rights. You know, in the 1790s, these Democratic Republicans will actually pass the first Fugitive Slave Act, a Fugitive Slave Act. And a Fugitive Slave Act is, you know, any slave that, that escaped or, or fled or left slavery in one state to another state where slavery was illegal um, had to be returned, was still the property of his owner, right? And it was, he had the right to reclaim that slave and bring him back so that geography did not change your condition as property, right? That's the Democratic Republicans, right? The parties of Jefferson and Madison that ultimately do that. You know, in certain private ways we know, you know, Jefferson ends slavery, uh, prevents slavery from being expanded into the Northwest and the Northwest ordinances, right? And yet, there's that weird dichotomy with him where he defends slave rights in these particular issues that he himself, as we know, is a major slave owner, as is Madison. Not everything is so cut and dry in history. But these help us understand the differences in these parties. And, you know, in truth, these parties would evolve. Why does Washington hate these parties so much? What is it essentially that he actually fears, right? What is it about bipartisanship that Washington is mostly worried about? Well, it's a couple of things. And honestly, these are the same complaints 
and challenges we hear about partisanship, particularly bipartisanship today in America, right? One of his biggest for concerns, you know, he's a classical Republican, right? And in his heart, he thinks that people in politics should be him, right? They should be great and talented individuals, right? Whose virtue has been proved through merit and who decide to go into politics and become leaders for disinterested, not uninterested, right? Remember this word, disinterested, meaning with no chance of self-gain. They just do it in a self-sacrificing way on behalf of the nation because they see themselves as part of this greater national community. This is what you do when you're one of the great men, right? You serve, and you serve as a leader, right? You don't serve in a menial way, right? That's where your talent lies. And he wanted a government that would attract those sort of individuals. He felt that's what politics should be. You know, and in many ways, you know, through most of his leadership, going all the way back to the French and Indian War, through the revolution in the Continental Congress, all the way up through the early, early 1790s, that is who our national leaders were, more or less, right? They did kind of fit this classical Republican disinterested model. Partisanship doesn't do that, right? You know, the problem with partisanship is, you know, parties will be more fractious. They'll divide us. They won't allow for consensus among leading individuals, right? And we'll have division rather than, like I said, consensus. There was a big worry about loyalty, right? Where will your loyalties lie? Will your loyalties lie to the nation as a whole? You know, the great challenge all along was how do we get people to think of themselves as Americans first, part of a national polity first, and everything else second, right? That was a challenge for Washington, challenges for all politics. Say partisanship does the exact opposite. Partisanship encourages us to enter into politics thinking of ourselves as members of a, pol a party first. Political leaders and their voters would be loyal to the party. They would put success of the party ahead of passing good legislation, ahead of the interests of the nation, right? That you will block uh, you know, one piece of legislation just because you don't want the other party to win or to have a victory or to gain against you in this struggle for a majority. That's also the inefficiency of bipartisanship, something we still complain about to this day for that exact reason. Good legislation and effective government policy can be delayed because of partisan divisions. And again, it's this idea of loyalty, right? That, that you know, the loyalty of the population of the leaders would be to party and not to the nation as a whole. And these are real concerns, right? That is a real concern in bipartisanship. We complain about that to this very day, right? There's a certain inefficiency, a certain lack of noble, disinterested leadership that very much rests in this idea of partisanship, that the parties do pick who our leaders are. They do determine who's electable and who isn't. Also underneath all of this is the deep fear that all Republicans, that is people who support Democratic republics, have when they first form them. And that's the fear of demagoguery, right? And populism. This idea that through party politics, people will stir up and inflame the passions of the masses. You know, mob rule, try to get, you know, sort of create a tyranny of a majority by firing up people's passions, by, you know, turning them against the oppositional parties, right? The fear of populism, right? stirring up the, 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 the passions of the masses rather than their intellect for your own political gain to, to become elected is always the, one of the deepest fears and the greatest challenges and threats to a, to a healthy democracy. And, and partisanship plays right into that. I mean, it, it does. Now, as I've said, certainly many of these fears are legitimate. Washington's concerns were certainly legitimate. Many of the things he said would happen with partisanship did happen and continues to happen. But my thinking is that many of Washington's fears are largely unwarranted. Right? I understand the source of his fears. I understand the inefficiency, the problems with loyalty to party over country. However, in the grand 
trajectory of American history, our government is actually fairly stable, fairly dynamic, right? It's a public university that is making the video you're watching right now. Partisanship does create a certain amount of inefficiency, but it hasn't completely destabilized government. It just hasn't. It ebbs and flows, and sometimes it's worse than others. Also, a healthy democracy needs opposition, right? Look at the very beginning of where partisanship starts in the ratification of the Constitution. Without vibrant opposition, there is no Bill of Rights. It does not happen. Now, like everyone watching this video, yes, I often hope and wonder if today's partisan divides will reflect such a strong and important and, and, and vibrant uh, oppositional ideology that creates a Bill of Rights in the face of a new powerful government. Right? I, I understand that all partisanship is not quite so high-minded. And yet, opposition parties are important. They do. They aren't efficient, but we've talked about efficiency and ideology before and what you really need. But they don't completely destabilize either. And in fact, I think for the grand scheme of American history, opposition parties and strong bipartisanship has done a great deal of good for the American democracy. The biggest problem, you know, we talked about this, foreign policy more or less worked its way out throughout the early republic. And partisanship becomes a reality. All of the problems Washington said it had, it did have, but it didn't destroy the country. And in some ways, it kept our democracy vibrant. But the greatest challenge, the one that really almost does destroy the American Union, our democracy, and our way of life, is the third one that Washington warns us about, and that is sectionalism. Loyalty to a region or a state beyond loyalty to the country or to anything else. That is your fundamental point of identity, culturally, politically, socially, and economically. This idea of sectionalism. He says this in his farewell address. He says, the name American, which belongs to you, in your national capacity must always exalt the just pride of patriotism more than any other appellation derived from local distinctions. He goes on to say that your union, meaning the, the country, America, your union ought to be the main prop of your liberty. Those are strong words. Sectionalism really is the most destructive component. You know, if we look in the colonial era, each colony had evolved on its own, distinct religious heritage, distinct settlement heritage, different economics, different governments. They really were 13 distinct uh, societies, right, in the 1750s. During the struggle of the 17, 1760s and into the 1770s, you know, Ben Franklin, our most globally minded leader, the one who comes up with the idea of thinking of ourselves as Americans, realizes that's the real challenge for the revolution in the early nation, getting people to stop thinking of themselves as Virginians and to think of themselves and this new identity as Americans, right? And sectionalism is the great challenge for that. In the very early national period, under the Articles of Confederation, we realize sectionalism is the greatest problem, right? That we have 14 states that each think of themselves as independent and in competition with the other states so that we can't create a unified foreign policy, unified monetary or commercial policy, right? We have all of this instability. We have sectionalism that's so deep, and this goes back to the colonial era and through the early national period, where people in the eastern part of a state see themselves as completely separate from people in the western part of their own state and often devise policies uh, and would abuse their majority to take advantage of their fellow members of their state in the western part. This is what gave us the violence of the regulator movements in the 1760s and 70s. Uh, it's what underpins the, the chaotic violence of Shays Rebellion, right, which leads to the Constitution in the first place and the scrapping of the Articles of Confederation. It's what gives us things like the Whiskey Rebellion in the 1790s. These sectional divides, by the end of the 1790s, that divide sectionally will not really be east and west, but it'll in fact be north and south. 
And that north and south divide, as we know, will become the most confounding, the most dangerous, and yes, the most deadly divide that grows from early America into later times. The Civil War, right, is still the most fractious and chaotic moment in American history. 640,000 Americans die in that war. It's fought entirely on our soil. It is incredibly destructive, right? Nothing else like this happens before or since in American history. And it is completely, completely based on, on sectionalism, a sectionalism that Washington himself saw growing. You know, one of the ways I like to look at the, this, this problem of sectionalism, a, a great example of how deep it becomes, you know, because it starts uh, you know, in the colonies and it hardens and it links itself to partisanship and it will link itself to economics, particularly the economics of slavery, right? So you have partisanship, states rights, sectionalizing slavery will create, you know, the greatest challenge to our federal union, our ability to think of ourselves as Americans that leads to an incredibly deadly conflict. General Robert E. Lee on the eve of the Civil War. Now, Robert E. Lee was known as a, as a virtuous and honorable man. He's the head of the United States Armed Forces. He's offered you know, command of the Union forces at the start of the Civil War. He's our leading general. He's a man who had sworn an oath to uphold the United States Constitution and defend the Union. However, on the eve of the Civil War, he resigns and becomes right, the, the military leader of the Confederacy and fights a hard four-year war in defense of an institution he personally hated, slavery. And he does it because of love of his home state. He identified so deeply as a Virginian rather than an American. And if you're, if you're leading generals who've sworn oaths are subject to sectionalism, it shows you how deep sectionalism really, really ran. Why this, of all the things Washington warned us, was the one to be most ever mindful of. You know, trying to think of some contemporary examples to put this all into, um, into perspective. And a book I read a few years ago uh, by a guy named Bill Bishop, who's a journalist, wrote a, a wonderful book. And he was written in 2004, so it's, you know, over a decade ago. But the book was called The Big Sort. And through a lot of good statistics and maps and stuff, he, sh he was showing how Americans, right, are moving and, and living in places where everyone thinks the same, right? That partisanship has actually gotten stronger over the last few decades. And not only that, it is once again linking itself up to sectionalism. That when we look at demographic maps of the United States, more and more we will see people clustered in large numbers where one political party holds sway, where there's one type of political cultural outlook, right? And it's defined by region. And taking George Washington's warnings seriously, right? the effects of foreign policy on the American national consciousness. The certain aspects of partisanship we should always be wary of, even though I do feel that partisanship has played a positive role in American democracy as well. But when we link in this third piece of sectionalism, even today we should be mindful of the dangers of when someone's identity and political identity becomes linked more to a region and a specific ideology other than the nation as a whole. Thank you.